Good afternoon and welcome to the Memorial Sloan Kettering Information Session, Prostate Cancer and Men's Health. Our host and moderator for today's call is Dr. James Eastham, Chief of the Urology Service at MSK. I will now turn the call over to Dr. Eastham. Please go ahead. Thank you very much and uh, thanks to everyone on the call today. Uh, we do appreciate uh, your participation and the questions that were sent in. As many of you know, September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, and this does provide us with an opportunity to address some key issues regarding um, diagnosis of prostate cancer and also management of uh, the disease. We have arranged what uh, I believe is an outstanding panel whom I will introduce uh, during the session um, as various questions are um, addressed. Um, as all of us know, COVID has taken over the headlines the last six months or so, and certainly that can provide many of us with a feeling of being vulnerable and just wanting to stay away and uh, lock ourselves in a room to some extent. Uh, but it's important to understand that many health issues continue despite uh, the COVID virus, and it's important to uh, keep in touch with your physicians and to continue with your uh, medical care, even if that medical care is simply screening. Uh, most medical centers, including Memorial, are back and operational. Uh, certainly screening issues like for prostate cancer um, should be addressed. Uh, telemedicine is certainly uh, something that is being used far more frequently and has proven to be very effective uh, in terms of being able to reach out to patients. If a blood test or some other procedure is required, most centers have very good procedures in place that are safe and allow you to have excellent medical care despite the ongoing issues uh, with COVID. So I do encourage everyone on this call, whether it's for your blood pressure, your cholesterol, or for screening for cancers and addressing cancer issues, to do continue um, to seek the appropriate uh, uh, medical care. And with that, um, again, most of the questions, if not all of the questions we will try to address today came in from folks on this call. Uh, we certainly can't address every single question. We've tried to select those that are most appropriate for a general audience rather than specific fine details, uh, but hopefully this will prove uh, beneficial to um, at least most of you, if not all of you on the call. So the, the first topic we're going to discuss is PSA. And PSA, as most of you know, is prostate-specific antigen. And I'll call on Dr. Sean McBride, who is one of our um, stellar radiation oncologists, out, simply outstanding, internationally and nationally recognized as a leader in the field. And Sean, if you could address um, simply how do we use PSA in terms of screening for prostate cancer? Let's start with that topic. Oh, that's an introduction. Um, so typically, PSA is used as a screening test. It's a blood test. And when the PSA is elevated above a certain value, and that value can depend on how old uh, the man is when he's getting this PSA, the PSA will be used to determine whether any additional investigation, like an MRI or a biopsy, uh, is necessary. That's sort, of the, that's sort of very broadly how PSA is used. Right. So, um, as I think you're, you're saying, PSA certainly doesn't diagnose prostate cancer. Uh, it basically tells us that something is going on in the prostate, and usually additional testing is needed um, to determine whether or not that PSA test needs to be evaluated at all. And one of the tests you mentioned is prostate MRI. Um, how is MRI used in terms of a man has an elevated PSA test and he may be recommended to undergo an MRI? What would the MRI help with? 
that's a great question. So I think the first point you make is a critical one to remember that just because a PSA is elevated does not mean that uh, that a guy has prostate cancer. There's multiple other reasons why a man can have an elevated PSA. But if a guy does have an elevated PSA, oftentimes that MRI is the first type of investigation or a, one of the first types of investigations that we do. And what you're looking at is your, the MRI gives you a very detailed, exquisite picture of the prostate and it can help there are certain um, pictures uh, that come with the MRI that can help uh, a guy's urologist determine whether there is likely to be a tumor in the prostate or cancer in the prostate and it can help guide if, if, if that is seen it can help guide the biopsy and give you a more accurate assessment uh, of that potential cancer right so it used to be that if any man had even a slight elevation in his PSA test, he was almost immediately recommended to have a prostate biopsy, and that proved problematic in terms of too many men getting unnecessary biopsies. And so now there are typically second-line screening tests. Um, imaging, like an MRI, is one of the things we do. Uh, there are some alternative blood tests. Uh, people on the call may have heard of something called a 4K score, something called prostate health index, which are two second uh, generation, if you will, screening tests to better assess a man's risk of having prostate cancer rather than just a PSA alone. Um, there's some urine tests that are available as well, such as PCA3, there's a newer one called Select MDX, but um, ultimately, if these studies do show um, a worrisome enough situation, a prostate biopsy is typically recommended. Now, if a biopsy is performed and that biopsy does show prostate cancer, one of the important aspects of prostate cancer is something called a Gleason score. Um, a Gleason score is a number system, which I'll ask Dr. Dana Rathkoff, who's one of our, again, stellar medical oncologists that works with men who have more advanced prostate cancer. But if, uh, Dana, if you could um, address what is a Gleason score and how would uh, you use it in practice? Thank you, James. So um, Dr. Gleason actually was a pathologist uh, from Minnesota who, you know, back in sort of the 1950s, 60s, developed a grading system to determine how aggressive prostate cancer is. We know that, you know, close to 200,000 men can be diagnosed with prostate cancer each year in the United States, but not everybody has the same type of cancer. They're not all the same type of aggressiveness, and so we need to figure out ways to tailor treatments appropriately. And so this Gleason grading system is a way of looking at the actual cancer cells that come from the prostate biopsy and giving them a number uh, to determine how aggressive they are or how risky the cancer is. And, and typically speaking, um, a Gleason score of six is considered low risk, meaning low risk of growing quickly, low risk of metastasizing, which means spreading to other parts of the body. Um, Gleason 7 would be intermediate risk, um, suggesting that, you know, maybe it, it will behave quietly, but it does have potential to become more aggressive. And then the high-risk patients are Gleason 8, 9, and 10, with 10 being the most aggressive uh, Gleason grade possible. And those are the patients that, as a medical oncologist, I typically worry about the most um, because they tend to be the patients with high-risk disease. And again, speaking about risk, suggesting that their cancer might grow quickly or might even spread outside of the prostate to other parts of the body, which could render them not curable. Thanks. That's a, that's a great summary. So the, the Gleason scoring uh, basically gives us, as Dr. Rathkoff said, an assessment of risk. And risk is important because that will guide how a man is treated or at least what his options for treatment are. So not all prostate cancers require immediate treatment. Um, those that are considered to be of low risk can actually be monitored. 
which is a whole process of what's called active surveillance. And active surveillance means rather than using any kind of treatment, we basically monitor patients. And we monitor PSAs, we monitor MRIs, occasionally we will repeat biopsies, and as long as risk stays low, we do not have to intervene. Now, that ends up being at least a third of the patients that we diagnose with prostate cancer. So, um, again, risk and this concept of Gleason scoring, which is the most important aspect of assessing risk, is critically important when making um, decisions. So that's a, a brief summary of Gleason scoring and active surveillance. Now, Gleason score can also guide management of prostate cancer that does require treatment. So I'll go back to um, Dr. McBride, Sean, and what about radiation therapy? There, have been, there are questions related to brachytherapy, questions related to newer developments in proton beam radiation. Um, how do you evaluate a man at diagnosis um, that you recommend treatment for, so not an active surveillance patient? How do you guide that man into the type of radiation therapy that he might best be suited for? Thanks, James. That's a great question. So, you know, there are multiple, t there are two um, two dominant types of radiation for prostate cancer. One, uh, as Dr. Houston mentioned, is brachytherapy or seed implantation into the prostate. And the other is external beam radiation therapy, where a robotic arm rotates around the prostate and delivers the radiation in 15-minute sessions. In terms of, in ter and, and occasionally for men with uh, slightly more aggressive prostate cancers, we'll recommend a combination of the seed implant and external beam radiation. How do we determine what sort of factors go into determining which radiation treatment type is best for a particular man? Um, in part, it is uh, the, the extent of any urinary symptoms he's having. If he's getting up a lot at night to urinate, if he's having to go somewhat urgently during the day, those types of urinary symptoms may suggest that he's better served by external radiation or obviously a, a prostatectomy. Um, brachytherapy as a single treatment for prostate cancer, we tend to reserve that for men with less aggressive prostate cancers. These are men with the so-called favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. We tend to use it in younger men um, and we tend to use it in men with normal size prostates who don't have a lot of urinary issues. Uh, for guys with slightly more aggressive prostate cancer, unfavorable intermediate risk or high risk prostate cancer, if they, if they have good urinary function, if they have normal size prostates, oftentimes we'll recommend a combination of brachytherapy, the seed implants, and external radiation. Uh, one of the newer types of radiation therapies that we have is um, is called SBRT or um, Saber treatment. This is external beam radiation therapy that can be delivered in five treatments, typically over a week and a half. We can utilize this for men with intermediate risk prostate cancer. We're starting to use it even in men with higher risk prostate cancer. Um, most men will qualify for this type of radiation treatment. And in addition to being logistically easier for most guys to come in for five treatments as opposed for the multi-week treatment regimens we would frequently employ years ago, um, it, it also may be a bit more effective than the more traditional radiation. Now, in terms of protons, um, obviously this gets a, a, a lot of billing. Um, I think protons potentially have a role in the treatment of prostate cancer. Um, certainly, protons are a type of radiation that may spare your normal healthy tissue more effectively than traditional radiation. But there are still, but we don't have what's called, um, we haven't run what's called a randomized controlled trial to demonstrate that, meaning a coin is flipped and half the guys in the trial get standard radiation and half the guys get proton radiation. And those trials haven't, have, have 
accumulated enough men, but we don't have the data yet to say whether protons offer a truly significant benefit for guys compared to the more standard radiation. So as I think everyone on the call can imagine, there are lots of issues um, uh, with radiation therapy in terms of what is the appropriate type of radiation uh, to deliver to a particular patient. And there's lots of nuances. And um, speaking with a radiation oncologist to review these um, is certainly critical in making decisions about uh, radiation therapy. Uh, certainly seeds are appealing, but they're not appropriate for every patient. Um, the same with SBRT or stereotactic radiation therapy, um, cyber knife it's sometimes uh, referred to. Again, that's a wonderful way to deliver radiation therapy, uh, but it's certainly not um, for everyone. Um, so uh, radiation is certainly a curative, appropriate treatment for most men diagnosed with prostate cancer and um, certainly um, results in uh, uh, excellent outcomes. Now, one of the things that uh, Dr. McBride alluded to during his uh, discussion of radiation is that, unfortunately, all treatments do carry side effects. And one of the side effects that can happen with any treatment for prostate cancer is a change in sexual function. And um, I'd like to bring on the, uh, or bring into the conversation at this point, uh, Dr. John Mulhall, who runs our sexual medicine um, uh, department and is an expert in management of erectile dysfunction, amongst other things. And John, what do you tell patients who um, initially, before uh, treatment, whether the treatment is surgery or radiation therapy, are there things that they can do to try to better their outcomes in terms of sexual function? And what can be done after treatment to try to maximize their um, either maintaining or recovering uh, their best uh, sexual function? Thank you, James. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to congratulate all of you as uh, potential patients um, attending this and gaining information. I think information is critically important in your decision making for what treatment you will pursue for your prostate cancer. I think the first thing to do is communication to your physician or physicians how important your sexual function is. Um, all treatments in prostate cancer, perhaps with the exception of active surveillance, have some potential negative effect uh, on your erectile function, which is the most common sexual dysfunction. Um, most of that is temporary after radical prostatectomy, but there are certain types of patients who will be left with long-term ED. Um, the time course of erectile function recovery after prostatectomy is typically optimized over an 18 to 24 month time period. So it's very common that men have problems in the first year and then over time there is an improvement. Radiation on the other hand is quite the opposite. Uh, in fact, there's usually very little negative effects within the first 12 months and then over the course of the ensuing 24 months, years two and three, there is a reduction in erectile uh, function. Um, typically, for radiation and surgery, the, the classic predictors of uh, long-term problems would be older men uh, tend to uh, struggle to have uh, recovery to baseline. Um, nerve sparing is very important in the prostatectomy group. The better the degree of nerve sparing, the more likely men are to have a good recovery. The dose of radiation, the use of androgen deprivation therapy will have some negative impact upon erectile function recovery. And generally speaking, the baseline erectile function, how healthy a man is and how good his erections are going into treatment. Um, we are blessed at Memorial that I'm a urologist, but we have the luxury of having a urologist who all he does for a living is a sexual um, medicine. So uh, myself and my nursing staff and our psychologists uh, work very carefully to maximize recovery. Um, we understand that the goal is to treat and cure prostate cancer. So we're very cognizant of that. But at the same time, we're focused on your quality of life. 
Um, the whole concept of rehabilitation, which is protecting your erectile tissue, if you put your hand around your penis, most of what's inside your hand is a muscle. And what we're really trying to protect during uh, the early stages after prostatectomy and radiation is keeping that muscle healthy, and that concept is called uh, penile rehabilitation, which mostly uh, revolves around the use of uh, the drug class called PD-5 inhibitors, which is uh, the Viagra and the Cialis drugs. And, I think I'll leave it at that for the moment, James, unless there are more detailed questions later. Okay. That's great. And one of the other aspects of recovery after surgery, not so much after radiation therapy, is continence. And there are things that uh, we certainly discuss with patients re regarding urinary continence. And the last but certainly not least of the panelists we have today is Claudia Derrico, who is uh, one of our nurse leaders in terms of our prostate cancer program. So, Claudia, welcome, number one. And number two, what do you discuss with patients regarding, again, what can they do to try to improve their outcomes um, in terms of recovery of continence after surgery, and what should their expectations be? Um, we heard from Dr. Mulhall that Erectile function can take many months to recover after surgery. Um, what about with urinary function? Thank you very much, Dr. Easton. Um, so when it really comes to bladder control after surgery, time is going to be the most important factor for our patients. Uh, for our patients and patients, having it is also very key. Um, so. Pelvic floor muscle exercises will help the patient strengthen the pelvic floor muscle. These muscles will help support the bladder. So most men do experience incontinence after surgery, most being the high 90% range. Um, but the expectation is that these patients will recover and become fully continent within one year. So that is our expectation uh, for our prostatectomy surgical patients. If their continence is slower to recover, um, sometimes there are formal physical therapy that can help. And at MSK, we're very fortunate to offer pelvic floor physical therapy for our patients um, as a rehab session after the surgery. So we offer those as well. So I would say time is key and also the exercises. Right. So. Again, it's uh, much of this is managing expectations. Um, if a man after treatment expects to be unaffected by that treatment, meaning unchanged urinary function, unchanged bowel function, normal sexual function, that man's going to be disappointed uh, because unfortunately, um, all of the treatments we deliver um, do impact quality of life, mostly in a a negative way, um, but ultimately men will recover. And while their new quality of life will be different, it certainly doesn't have to be a bad quality of life. So changes are expected. Some of the changes are better than before. Some are not as good. But ultimately, um, with experts such as Dr. Mulhall, um, and in our physical therapy, we also have voiding function experts, et cetera. Um, we try to optimize quality of life for these patients. One of the other areas that uh, we have done a lot of research at Memorial is in looking at ways to still cure prostate cancer, but try to have less of an impact on quality of life. And that's what's called focal therapy. It's, very, it's essentially the same as doing a lumpectomy or just removing a portion of the breast in breast cancer rather than removing the entire breast. So the concept is delivering an energy source to the prostate in the area where the cancer is located. The energy source can be a variety of different things. It can be radiation therapy like a seed implant it can be cold or freezing the prostate, which is cryotherapy. Um, it can be heating the prostate, which is um, done with either laser or 
uh, focused ultrasound, high intensity focused ultrasound. So there are a number of different energy sources that can be used which destroy prostate tissue. And if we destroy less tissue, the likelihood of impacting continence or sexual function should be less as well. The difficulty is in knowing exactly where the cancer is located and ablating or destroying uh, the cancer. And that's the research aspect of delivering these energy sources. We know we can kill prostate tissue quite effectively. It's just how much do we kill or how little do we kill, and that's where clinical trials are still being done. So you will find centers around the country, including our own, that deliver HIFU or um, some other energy source to do um, partial treatment of the prostate to destroy the prostate cancer, um, but it truly is investigational. Um, it is not considered to be a standard of care, and it should be given as under the guise of a clinical trial so that we can get the information that's required to know if it is appropriate, and if it is appropriate, who are the best patients. So we do have physicians in our urology department that uh, deliver focal therapy, but it is in a very select group of men um, that qualify for um, our clinical trial. So um, focal therapy is certainly something that will be used increasingly in prostate cancer. It's just not ready for every man um, at this uh, particular time. So I want to go back to Dr. Raskoff for a, for a moment um, because Unfortunately, surgery and radiation therapy don't always cure the patient. And the way um, we determine that in, in almost all instances is with monitoring PSA. So I know it's two separate issues for a surgery patient versus a radiation patient, um, but let's assume the patient has demonstrated by his PSA test that he has recurrence. Um, what is your recommendation for evaluation, and then how are most of these men managed um, if their PSA is deemed worrisome enough uh, to warrant treatment? Oh, thank you, James. So, um, you know, unfortunately, despite all our best practices and, um, you know, we've heard about all these different surgical and radiation-based techniques, there will be some proportion of patients that will have a recurrence in their prostate cancer as measured by PSA. And that's a difficult situation to be in because PSA is pathognomonic for prostate cancer, meaning that it's made only by the prostate. And if you've had the prostate irradiated or the prostate removed, you should not have um, detectable amounts of PSA that are rising um, dramatically in the body. And so if that if that starts to happen, the way we typically um, assess a patient is we look at not just the absolute value, which is the actual number, but how fast the PSA is going up. We look at the initial, uh, the initial factors um, of the prostate cancer, meaning what was the Gleason score, which I had referred to earlier. Was it high risk, um, which might suggest that the cancer cells have spread beyond the area of the prostate? Um, was it intermediate risk? At the time of surgery, were there lymph nodes involved? Is the margin positive or negative? And maybe, James, you can talk to that a little bit more in a moment. Um, but all these things give us some clues as to whether the cancer driving the PSA is still in the area where the prostate was, which we would call the prostate bed pelvic area, or if the cancer cells may ha might have spread beyond that area and have metastasized um, in a way that we won't be able to cure it. And so oftentimes the evaluation of a patient who has a rising PSA um, felt to be related to prostate cancer after surgery or radiation is that we'll do imaging of, of some type. Um, that could be a CAT scan, a bone scan, an MRI. There are some investigational research tests PET scans that we'll sometimes use. And all of this is looking for residual cancer. Um, but more often than not, we won't see 
uh, cancer in these imaging studies because it's very, very early detected by PSA, a blood test only. And in that setting, we need to use all these different factors to decide whether we are still able to cure the cancer, which would mean that the cancer is still in the area where the prostate was, and we might consider hormones and radiation for a period of time to that area uh, directly, or um, if the cancer is more likely to have spread beyond the prostate area, in which case we would consider it um, metastatic and we would have a different, we wouldn't be able to cure the cancer necessarily in that setting, but it, we would certainly be able to treat it and treat it for many years to come. And so I think I'll, I'll stop there <laughs> before I take up the whole time. Oh no, it's it's a it's an important but as most topics with prostate cancer, um it's quite complicated and on an individual basis there may be different scenarios. So it's certainly not oh your PSA is going up a little bit after surgery or it's going up a little bit after radiation therapy, you have to immediately do something. Um I know everyone worries about their PSA, and certainly PSA after treatment that is increasing typically does signify um, persistence or recurrence of cancer, but not all rising PSAs carry the same threat, and not all of them require the same management. Now, one of the, the um, treatments that is often used um, either in combination with radiation therapy for higher risk patients or certainly in patients who have more advanced prostate cancer that has spread beyond the prostate to other parts of the body is hormonal therapy. And hormonal therapy is the most important and uh, initial um, treatment for metastatic prostate cancer. So I'll ask Dana, um, what about hormonal therapy? Um, what is the expectation of response? And again, PSA will be utilized. And how do you counsel patients about the potential side effects from hormonal therapy? So uh, hormone therapy refers to using treatments that lower the sex hormone testosterone. And testosterone is a male hormone that's analogous to estrogen in women. Um, women make estrogen from their ovaries, and over time, the ovaries convolute or, or stop making estrogen, and that induces a menopause type of state. Um, all women who get to a certain age will, will experience that, that situation. Um, but for men, the testicles, which make testosterone, continue to function well into old age. And what we do in the setting of prostate cancer is we artificially shut off the production of testosterone from the testicles because we've learned over time that testosterone binds to a receptor on the cancer cells called the androgen receptor and actually causes the cancer cells to grow. So testosterone is like the food for prostate cancer. And that's why when we have a patient with a recurrent metastatic prostate cancer that we feel needs to be treated, we will very, very frequently use this type of hormonal therapy to shut off testosterone, and in doing so, we starve the cancer cells. We stop them from growing. Now, when we remove testosterone from the body, we're starving the cancer cells, and they may shrink, um, and they, they will stop growing, and as a result, they become less active, and the PSA will come down. But the prostate cancer cells are not killed, typically, by removing testosterone. There may be some that, that a you know, few that may die early from that sh initial shock, but um, most of the prostate cancer cells will still be in the body. They're just not functioning. They're not growing because they don't have, they don't have this food testosterone. Some of the side effects of removing testosterone from the body uh, can be very similar, as I sort of alluded to earlier, to menopausal type symptoms. And there's really a continu continuum of toxicity. So, you know, some men experience very significant and severe side effects from moving, removing testosterone, and it can be fatigue, mood changes, um, certainly change in sexual function, not just the inability to maintain an erection, but loss of libido. Um, hot flashes that, that can keep them awake at night over time, I, uh, loss of bone density, uh, muscle mass. But the majority of these 
side effects or toxicities from removing hormone therapy um, can be managed. They might not be completely reversed, but there are a lot of ways that we can think about controlling these toxicities. Um, and some of the ways we can do that is through lifestyle and exercise. And, you know, certainly here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we have, and, and many centers there, we have a nutrition program um, to help with diet. We have rehabilitation and physical therapy medicine to help with muscle loss. Um, we have a, an excellent endocrinology service so we can think about uh, bone health and bone protection. We have counseling uh, to deal with mood changes specifically targeted for men with prostate cancer. Of course, John Mulhall, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our erectile dysfunction clinic, which is you know, harder to see him than it is to see me. The wait list is, is so long. Um, and, I, and I can go you know, on and on about this, but I, I think you know, the important thing to know about the take home message about removing testosterone from the body is that it starves the cancer cells, but doesn't kill the cancer cells. Um, and that most of the toxicities, although they may you know, be, of course, um, irritating, um, the majority of the toxicities can be managed. Um, it's typically not dangerous uh, to a patient to receive hormone therapy, although, again, you know, it, it often requires lifestyle management and close, close interaction with your physician to discuss these side effects as they, as they start to occur. Thanks, Dana. So, um Maybe a, a slightly off topic, but something I think that is coming up more frequently in clinics um, is the role of testosterone replacement. So men um, have lower testosterone uh, levels as they grow older, and replacing testosterone has become an industry unto itself, um, and some men have prostate cancer, but also have low testosterone levels. Um, so I know that's an area where uh, Dr. Mulhall has uh, some experience. So John, um, what do you tell a man who has prostate cancer? He may be on just active surveillance, or he may have been treated for prostate cancer. What is your conversation with that gentleman um, about testosterone replacement? Is it safe? Is it wise? Should he not do it? Um, why don't you go through some of those aspects? Right. So this, of course, is a topic that's uh, worthy of an entire hour lecture. So um, let me give you just some high points. First of all, the label for testosterone products say, do not give testosterone therapy to men with prostate or breast cancer. Okay, so that's in the label. So the use of testosterone therapy in the patient with prostate cancer, whether it be active surveillance, prostatectomy, radiation, or uh, double or triple therapy for prostate cancer, is an off-label indication. Okay? And while we have among the world's largest experience in all three of those groups in testosterone therapy, the patient needs to be aware of the absence of long-term safety data um, for testosterone therapy in, in these groups. Um, it would require many thousands of men followed for 10 to 15 years to really define its absolute safety, and we just don't have that. We have been giving testosterone to prostatectomy patients for 16 years. We have been giving testosterone to active surveillance patients for 10 years, and likewise, uh, radiation. Um, if you don't have prostate cancer, giving you testosterone therapy does not increase your risk of prostate cancer. That's a very, very important thing that you need to understand. The indications for testosterone therapy are man, men who have what's called testosterone deficiency, and that is defined as the presence of low testosterone. That's two early morning total testosterone levels that are abnormal. Uh, we use less than 300. That is the guidelines. Uh, combined with the presence of symptoms and or signs of low testosterone. So you need both of those two things to become a candidate for the rational uh, approach to testosterone therapy. Now, the symptoms are very straightforward, low energy, afternoon fatigue, decreased strength, decreased endurance, losing muscle, um, putting on fat, particularly around the middle, irritability, depression, decreased productivity at work, decreased response to exercise, and low sex drive. They are also the symptoms of chronic stress, chronic fatigue, and depression. So they are not specific to low testosterone. There are two very specific signs that are worthy of consideration. One is an elevated hemoglobin A1C. Men who have new onset prediabetes may be put into that situation because their testosterone level is low, and then bone density loss. 
I'm sure you're familiar with the term osteoporosis in menopause of women. That can occur in men also, and one of the more common causes of that is low testosterone. So when a man comes into us, he meets the definition of testosterone deficiency, then it's a discussion about the pros and cons and risks and benefits of testosterone therapy. It's very important to understand that in a, a well-structured, established program like we have at Memorial, we don't give testosterone therapy to men to help them build muscle and to help them feel 18 years of age again and to look good at the gym. We give testosterone therapy to men because very low levels of testosterone, certainly levels below 200, are associated with three major medical problems, pre-diabetes and diabetes, osteopenia or osteoporosis, and premature cardiovascular events, heart attacks and strokes. That is irrefutably established in the medical literature. So much of what we do is to prevent those things happening. Um, the, con the conversation in the active surveillance and the prostatectomy patient, the radiation patient, is, is complicated. We have clinical care pathways. We have algorithms for treating these men. And I think perhaps, James, it's beyond the, um, the scope of this discussion, unless you wanted me to get into it, to have a, a kind of a more granular discussion about that. Right. So, uh, yes, it's not, as, as Dr. Mulhall appropriately mentioned, it's not uh, um, someone who's trying to build muscle up who doesn't have the low testosterone and or, or and symptoms related to low testosterone. It's a very specific clinical situation in which testosterone would be replaced and has to be closely monitored in every man, um, including a man with prostate cancer. Um, I wanted to bring Claudia back into the conversation uh, because Many men will ask, well, what are the symptoms I'm going to experience with prostate cancer? Should I be looking for something? Um, men on active surveillance frequently say, well, what are the, the signs and symptoms that will be worrisome to me? So, Claudia, can you address what, what will a man um, who has prostate cancer, um, will they experience any symptoms and what might they be? Sure. So initially, uh, there really are essentially no physical uh, symptoms of early prostate cancer in the very early stages. That's why, as you said in the beginning of this session, it's really so crucial um, that routine PSA monitoring is performed and physical exams are done so that there is early detection of disease. Um, later, as the disease does progress, some patients do experience uh, impact to their urinary function and also some um, issues when it comes to bone density. But again, really early in the early stages of prostate cancer, we do not see or have patients look out for specific physical symptoms simply because they just won't exhibit them. All right. Thank, thank you. Claudia for that. I wanted to, and I'll take the stage for a couple of minutes, a couple of things uh, came up during uh, some of the responses. One from Dr. Rathkoff mentioned about positive margins and the pathology that we re, um, are able to achieve with um, a prostate removal. A positive margin is a risk factor for recurrence. So let me take a step back and tell you what a positive margin is. So when a prostate is removed, the first thing the pathologist will do is paint the outside of the entire prostate with ink. The prostate is then um, cut, just like a loaf of bread, into many slices, and those slices are looked at under the microscope. If the pathologist sees a cancer cell near the ink or at the ink, that is what a positive margin is. So a positive margin um, is a finding under the microscope that is basically a cancer cell adjacent to the inked edge. That is not the same as there are cancer cells left in the patient that are alive. And that's why we do not recommend that a patient be treated simply because their margin was positive uh, at the time of surgery. Now, it may mean there are some cancer cells behind, but that is determined by what the PSA does. So a positive margin does increase 
the chance that a PSA becomes detectable after surgery, but it's not everyone with a positive margin recurs. Um, in some situations, uh, you know, the there may have been a few cells left behind, but they are now disconnected from their blood supply and they die. So while the margin was positive, there are no viable cells left within the patient. Margins can also be what are called artificial, meaning that during the processing, the tissue of the prostate may have cracked a little bit, and that will allow ink to run deeper into the prostate than was truly the edge. So a positive margin is just a finding. It does not mean that there will be definite recurrence of cancer, which is where PSA comes into consideration. Um, the other area, and this was a, um, just trying to get to other questions, but I think we have a little bit of time to address this, is with active surveillance, which means a patient with low-risk prostate cancer who is being monitored, one of the questions was, how do you monitor? And there is no set definition of how every center monitors patients on active surveillance. What we typically do is we check PSA tests about every six months. We obtain MRIs sequentially about every 18 to 24 months. And we do biopsies no more frequently unless something changes, which I'll define in a moment, no more frequently than about every three years. Um, so we have cut down on the number of biopsies that we do because we have not found that doing more frequent biopsies is beneficial, and certainly that is the assessment that carries the most discomfort and the most risk. So if a patient's PSA is stable and their MRI doesn't change, biopsies are still performed. Um, and that's because the biopsy is the only true way to know what's going on within the prostate. Um, even if the PSA and the MRI are unchanged, you can still have changes under the microscope. So that's why we need to do biopsies. So it is truly active surveillance. We actively monitor the patient to be sure that the risk of the cancer has not changed. The final set of questions, which I'll address initially to Sean and then to Dana, relate to the genetics of prostate cancer. Um, so, Sean, from a radiation standpoint, are there genetic aspects that you use either in the initial treatment of a, of a patient or if someone has gone through surgery and has failed and they are a candidate for local radiation to the prostate, can genetics help um, guide how you would recommend treatment in those two different situations? I think that's a, that's a great question, James. And right now, we're not at the point where genetic information about a man's prostate cancer impacts um, the uh, radiation treatment, either at diagnosis or if a man's recurred after surgery. There are studies that are looking at combinations of certain types of medications, and Dana could probably expound on this a little more, certain types of medications with radiation in men who have certain types of mutations, namely a BRCA2, BRCA1, the BRCA gene mutations. But those are being done on clinical trials and are not part of our standard care at this point in time. Now, that said, we'll still oftentimes, in men with high-risk localized prostate cancer, will obtain genetic information about a man's tumor and about whether a man has an inherited predisposition towards cancer. But that's not really modifying the treatment we're delivering at this point, although it may in the future. Okay. And, and Dana, in the, in the metastatic setting, um, how, are genet how is genetic uh, evaluation used to perhaps select a man for one form of treatment versus another? Is that ready for prime time or uh, is it still investigational? So uh, it's very much ready for prime time, which is exciting. So, um, you know, as Sean alluded to, we'll often ask patients 
permission to look at their tumor to see if there are any alterations in the genes in that tumor that we might be able to target with specific therapies um, or if they might, you know, just in case they might predict for how a patient's going to respond to different therapies um, over time. There's also, um, we'll ask permission sometimes not just to look at the genes in the tumor, um, which we suspect have some alterations just by nature of the fact that these normal cells have turned into cancer cells. Um, but also there are sometimes familial or inheritable mutations that are in the patient's own germline, um, their own DNA that can be passed on between families. Um, most commonly, um, you know, in, in 2020, uh, the ones that we talk about, as, as Sean just mentioned, are the DNA damage repair genes uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2, although there are others as well. And so for patients that have a DDR mutation, whether it's in the tumor or in their germline, we have uh, just recently gotten permission from the FDA to use a class of drugs called PARP inhibitors, which have been used in other cancers with these type of mutations for many years. And finally, we've been able to show that they're also useful um, in prostate cancer, and that's very exciting, this, these class of drugs called PARP inhibitors. And there are a number of, of different ones um, that, that appear to work. Um, we'll also use genetics or uh, genomic profiling to think about other types of interventions. So, you know, I think one of the most commonly asked questions for me in the clinic is about immunotherapy. And it turns out that prostate cancer in general tends to be what we call a cold tumor. It doesn't have a lot of um, a lot of immunogenicity, so it, it doesn't really attract your own immune system to attack it. But we have found that for patients that have something called microsatellite instability high, that they are able to attract the immune system better than prostate cancer patients who don't have that. And so in that setting, we will sometimes use immunotherapy in prostate cancer patients, um, but still that's a, you know probably less than 5% um, of prostate cancer patients at the moment who have that type of presentation. There are a, a large number of clinical trials that we're looking at asking questions about other alterations um, that we find in the genome. Um, you know, for example, P10 is one that you might hear about. It, it can be a poor prognosticator, meaning that men who have loss of the, the P10 gene may have worse outcomes. And so we've been looking at drugs that target that pathway. Um, and recently there was a large phase three clinical trial called Ipotential um, 150 that showed that a, a drug called Ipatacertib that targets AKT had some increased activity in patients with P10 loss. And that's, of course, um, exciting, but not quite ready to be used um, in the clinic. So, yeah, thank you. That's, uh, so genetics are certainly already being used in prostate cancer. Um, it's not every single man that has an, what we call an actionable finding, meaning they have a genetic change that we can actually target with a specific drug, um, but certainly um, in the laboratory and within our, our center and our research uh, um, efforts, um, progress is being made uh, quite rapidly in this arena. Um, looking at the at the time, unfortunately, we're coming to an end of this session. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone on the call uh, for sticking with us. Um, I'm sure we didn't um, address every single uh, topic that uh, was on everyone's mind. Uh, for that, I apologize, but there are limitations to what we can do on a, a phone conference, but I, I do hope this was beneficial um, to you in one way or another. I also want to thank, of course, the um, panel members. Um, they, I think, it, at least from my standpoint, I learned a little bit listening to the folks uh, talk about the various aspects of care, and so I want to thank uh, um, all of the panel members for uh, participating and hopefully providing the information that was beneficial uh, to the folks <clears throat> on the call. Uh, we certainly plan to have more calls like this, not necessarily for prostate cancer, but if you uh, 
um, periodically check uh, the website mskcc.org. You will have the latest updates available to you when informational discussions like this are planned. Um, the final uh, two things, certainly don't ignore your health care. Um, I know that COVID is very scary. Um, certainly I'm nervous about it. Um, and I know there are precautions we all can and should take um, in terms of uh, social distancing, masks, washing hands, et cetera. Uh, but certainly we do have to be aware of our other health care needs, including uh, cancer screenings um, such as prostate cancer. So I would like to, again, thank everyone for participating on the call. Uh, do be safe and take care of yourself and your loved ones. And um, I hope this was an, uh, uh, provided the information that you were looking for. And thank you very much. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that, uh, but if you do, the I will be quiet. This concludes today's call. Thank you for joining Memorial Salon Kettering's information session for patients and caregivers. Have a good evening.